You say that financial services firms are leaving money on the table in terms of how they are catering to women. Why is that and by how much? Our research found that financial services firms are systematically underserving and not meeting the needs of women as customers. And as a result, there's a $700 billion revenue gap each year uh, on the table for, for banks if they were to better serve their needs. So the fact is that women have structural differences in their lives to men, uh, which impact their financial lives. So they're more likely to live longer, to take primary caregiving responsibilities, to work part time, to be a minority in the room in a corporate setting. And as a result, what appear to be gender neutral financial services propositions, in fact, often end up defaulting towards the male average. So if we were to take a, a specific example, in insurance, we found that women are more likely to be un or underinsured than men are. In retail banking, women are less likely to have access to credit at the same rate as men. That's both mortgages and personal loans. So our analysis looks at what would happen if those gaps were to close and banks were able to serve women in the same way that they are serving men. And that's where the $700 billion revenue opportunity lies. And to be clear, that's not about creating products or propositions which are pink or marketed solely towards women. It's about understanding these unmet needs and, as a result, creating propositions which are better for all customers, both men and women. You talked about credit there, and we've seen uh, that Apple and Goldman Sachs have been caught up in uh, unintentionally discriminating when they use algorithms to decide on what credit limits women get. So what responsibility does AI play, and how can it be a force for good? As you say, AI is becoming increasingly important in financial services and increasingly embedded in financial decision making. The fact is that AI is built off whatever inputs go into it. So there is a real risk that if the inputs that go in consist of gender bias, then the outputs will also result in gender bias outputs. But this is an opportunity. AI is still developing and we have an opportunity now to make sure that the inputs and what we're creating in terms of the algorithms and financial services extract that human bias and get to a place where the outcomes for men and for women are the same. If you look at the financial services industry though, you know, the, the, the problem is compounded because there are so few women in those senior executive positions. I mean, you were analysing around 470 companies, you spoke to 200 leaders across 30 odd countries. Tell me, when you drill down into the research, what, what were your findings? So this is the, the third year we've launched the report. So we have quite a unique insight in that we've got now a series of data historically looking at, looking at the representation of women in executive committees and boards in financial services. I think it's important to note, first of all, that actually over the last 10 years or so, there has been really good progress. So when we started our index back in 2003, the representation of women on excos and on boards was just 11%. Today, in 2019, that's increased to 20% for executive committees and 23% for boards. And that's the global figure? On a global, on a global basis. So headline figures were moving in the right way, and that's positive progress. But the fact is that 20% still isn't enough. And when you look a bit more in depth into the data, actually there's a large disparity, certainly in terms of countries. Uh, so the representation of women ranges from 38% in Israel down to almost 0% in a number of different geographies. The UK sits at about 20% around the global average. Speaking about the UK, um, November the 14th is the day which effectively women stop earning in comparison to men. We call it equal pay day. Um, policymakers are having some traction legislating and uh, in publishing, you know, making companies publish their gender pay gap. Do you think it's now the responsibility of shareholders, though, to hold companies to account in terms of diversity? I think it's the responsibility of individual firms, of supervisors, of shareholders, of everyone who's involved in the ecosystem to really progress this issue. So we are starting to see some shareholders put more pressure on their investment firms to address gender balance, it's typically starting at board level, but that's starting to trickle down into the exco and into mid-management. But I think a combination of both 
the individual firms policy making pressure from those external forces, that's the only way we're really going to push on to the next wave of change.